this week on the Green Left News Podcast, Defending University Encampments, the 2024 Federal Budget, and Labor's Racist Refugee Bill. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Hello and welcome to episode 40 of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis and I'll be taking you through the latest news from across the country and around the world. Now let's start off as usual with the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, which after seven months is continuing to expand, diversify and accelerate with heaps going on across the country from student encampments to mass rallies, pickets and direct action. So the 31st week of consecutive protests took place on the weekend of May 11 and 12 and also coincided with Mother's Day. And protesters brought signs highlighting the desperate plight of mothers in Gaza and said, all I want for Mother's Day is a free Palestine. I want a free Palestine for Mother's Day. I want this war to end, this genocide to stop. I want for Palestine to be free. I want liberation for Palestine, which will mean liberation for the mothers of Palestine who have put their lives on the line to protect their children. Uh, I want that mothers of the mothers of Gaza should also celebrate the mothers uh, like all the other world, mothers in the world. Stop killing children and mothers and, and people that we should be free on the their land. You know, all mothers should be able to tuck their kids in at night and not wonder if they're going to wake up or not. And they should also hug their children like we do. They shouldn't have to watch their children be burnt. They shouldn't have to watch their children um, have you know their rights taken away from them. All I want for Mother's Day is a free Palestine. One sign in Nam or Melbourne pointed out the horror, saying, Happy Mother's Day. 37 mothers killed daily, at least 19,000 orphans, and 15,000 kids killed and counting. In Corner Yurta or Adelaide, the rally pointed out that two mothers are killed every hour by Israel, and that 70% of the victims of the genocide are women and children. The rallies took place after Australia, along with 142 other countries, voted for a UN resolution that supported steps towards Palestinian statehood. Nine countries, including the US and Israel, voted against, with 29 abstaining. The vote reflects the pressure on Labour from the pro-Palestinian movement, but Foreign Minister Penny Wong was quick to clarify that Palestinian statehood was an aspiration and could only come after Israel and Palestine had negotiated two states. Labour still refuses to take any meaningful action to stop the genocide, refusing to cancel weapons and other trade with the apartheid genocidal state, even as it escalates its attacks on Rafa. Emergency rallies were held in several cities in response to the Rafa invasion, with thousands turning up in short notice. The weekend march in Gadigal or Sydney was bigger than recent weeks, with many mothers joining, including pushing babies and children in prams. And after Prime Minister Anthony Albanese labelled the From the River to the Sea chant as violent and provocative, Palestinian activist Jana Fayad kicked off the rally by pointing out his hypocrisy. For seven months of genocide, 76 years of occupation and apartheid, our so-called Prime Minister seems to have an issue with all people living from the river to the sea. Why don't we show him what we think of that? From the river to the sea! The protest marched to the Gaza Solidarity Encampment at the University of Sydney to show support for the students. Now, the camp at UCID has been going for more than three weeks and was the first of at least 13 encampments across the country. Some of these encampments, including Monash University and Adelaide University, have been targeted by Zionist groups who have attacked the camps and threatened students. In response, large rallies have been held with hundreds joining students and staff to protect the encampments. Now, shamefully, some universities, including ANU and Deakin University, have moved to try and shut down the encampments, 
but students have pledged to continue camping out until their universities cut ties with weapons companies and Israel for good. At the University of Melbourne, students have started a permanent occupation of the Arts West Building, which they have renamed Mahmoud's Hall in honour of Mahmoud al Nauk, who was a 25-year-old Palestinian in Gaza who was murdered by an Israeli airstrike on October 20. And Mahmoud had been awarded an Australia Awards Scholarship and was intending to study a Master's of International Relations, and the University of Melbourne was his first choice. And shamefully, the university management have refused to acknowledge his death, so it's great that students have been able to memorialise him at the Mahmoud's Hall. Students had to build a barricade after threats from the university that they had contacted police, but fortunately they didn't end up attacking the encampment, and staff have been uh, standing out the front protecting students Now, back at the University of Sydney, there was a historic victory when the National Tertiary Education Union branch voted to support an institutional academic boycott of Israeli universities and to cut ties with the weapons industry and militaries in general. The motion passed with a huge margin of 93% supporting, and it was the first successful BDS motion by the NTEU at any university and sets a precedent for others to follow. The motion said the university is implicated in the genocide and killing of Palestinians while it maintains ties with weapons manufacturers and militaries that arm or support Israel. Now, meanwhile, students from the encampments across the country have released an open letter condemning the repeated attacks from Israel supporters on students at various campuses and also pointing out that the encampments are nonviolent protests and reject all forms of racism and discrimination including Islamophobia, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and anti-Semitism. The open letter was published in response to claims in mainstream media and from politicians that the encampments were anti-Semitic because they are opposed to the state of Israel and Zionist ideology. The letter pointed out that many Jewish students are playing a leading role in organizing the encampments and they have strong support from anti-Zionist Jewish organizations across the country. The open letter ended with a call for university management to meet with students and discuss their demands in a public meeting with all staff and students welcome to attend. May 15 marked the 76th anniversary of the Nakba, or catastrophe, when Zionist terrorists began the mass displacement of Palestinians from their homeland to build the apartheid colonial settler state of Israel in 1948. Rallies were held across the country to mark this important day. The rally in Gadigal or Sydney, hearing from Nakba survivor Dr. Mohammed Khaled Abu Mahmoud before marching through the streets of the CBD. rally, a Victorian Parliament debate over cutting ties with Elbert Systems was broadcast live onto the Parliament steps after Labor voted to ban people from attending in person. The motion was voted down by Labor and Liberals, with Labor not even showing up to the debate. In Geelong, a silent candle walk was held through the city's restaurant district before people spelt out the word Gaza with candles out the front of the city hall. Now, it feels like we've barely scratched the surface of all that's happened in the last few weeks, so make sure to check out our more detailed coverage at greenleft.org.au and follow our Instagram at greenleftonline or other social media for photos and videos. On our website, you can also find an interview with Professor Mazin Kumsia, who's a Palestinian scientist and sustainability expert who's currently on a speaking tour of Australia and New Zealand. And Kumsi is the founder of the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability at Bethlehem University, and he spoke to Green Left's Alex Bainbridge about the genocide and ecocide in Gaza. So uh, I'm here on my first trip to Australia, and then I go to New Zealand. The idea is to speak about what's going on in Palestine, why we have a regional conflict now that's threatening to spread into a global conflict, and how this impacts everybody, and how peace and justice 
are really essential for survival of the human species. You can check out the full interview online, on YouTube, or in the podcast feed. Now, along with protests and encampments, community pickets of weapons companies have continued across the country. One of these is the 12-week community picket of Heat Treatment Australia in Campbellfield in Nam. Now, HTA, or Heat Treatment Australia, provides crucial heat treatment for components of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters, which are being used in Israel's genocide in Gaza. In response to the ongoing picket and protests, HTA has erected a sign which claims that the facility is not involved in F-35 production. And CEO Norm Tucker clarified, saying that the heat treatment for military components are now done at the Maganjin or Brisbane facility. So pro-Palestine activists hailed this as a victory, telling a media conference that weapons production has moved out of Campbellfield because of our sustained pickets. But they said they were going to keep up action until weapons were not being manufactured across the country. Another picket was held outside the gates of Bissaloy Steel in Tarawal or Wollongong on the 10th of May to protest its links with the Israeli military. Now, workers did not attempt to leave or enter the site for four hours while the picket was held. And Bissaloy supplies specialized steel for armored personnel carriers and light armored vehicles, which are used by the Israeli military. And it also has uh, contracts with Israeli war companies Rafael and Plasen Reem. Protest organizers said this is not the first nor the last action that will take place here. And this was actually the third community picket that's been held at the factory. A previous action on April 5 resulted in four arrests after activists locked on to machinery and shut down operations at the facility. The one before that on January 8, uh, 30 protesters held a sit-in at the Bissaloy office, with one Jewish man being arrested when police violently broke up the peaceful protest. Now, protesters are also targeting the federal government for its surging military spending, with some gathering at Railway Square in Gadigal or Sydney on May 7 as part of an international day of action against military spending. They asked why Labor is spending $100 billion a year on the military, more than it spends on health or education. If you're watching this, I'm in prison. Uh, again, all I can do is thank the supporters. I'm not going to complain. Uh, I went into this with my eyes open. I always said uh, I would go to prison with my head held up high, and it may be that I need to go to prison in order to fix this country. Uh, we need to look at how this country can pretend that I'm a national security threat when there are so many other things wrong with it. Uh, so much bribery, so much corruption, even war criminals that haven't been in jail, and leaders of our uh, completely failed war effort. 20 years, $6 trillion, uh, 41 Australians, good Australian soldiers dead, and no one has had to answer for it, except for me, because I have damaged national security. Now, in an outrageous decision, war crimes whistleblower David McBride has been sentenced to almost six years jail for his role in revealing war crimes. McBride went public with information about war crimes committed by Special Air Service or SAS soldiers after his internal complaints were ignored. Stella Assange said it was shameful that the only person going to prison over war crimes is the man who blew the whistle. The crimes include the killing of civilians and people who'd been captured or injured by Australian soldiers. In comparison to McBride's punishment, SAS veteran Oliver Schultz, who shot Afghan man Dad Mohammed in 2012, was granted relaxed bail conditions and was awarded the commendation for gallantry in Afghanistan. McBride has always said he gave the ABC the documents as an act of public duty, and he spent five years waiting for sentencing, and now faces a minimum of two years in jail. Michael West Media pointed out that McBride was not even allowed to argue his case in court, as the public interest defence was ruled out. He was therefore compelled to plead guilty, and many are asking what kind of justice is it that allows a whistleblower to be tried and convicted, while the actual war crimes go unprosecuted and unpunished. Kill the bill! 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 
Simultaneous protests were held in three cities on May 11 against Labor's draconian and racist refugee bill. The bill gives the, minister, the immigration minister more powers to lock up and deport refugees and implement travel bans from countries from where people are seeking asylum. The bill would mean any asylum seeker who resists being deported back to death or danger could immediately be locked up in detention centres. The bill is reminiscent of the travel bans implemented by former US President Donald Trump, which were widely condemned. And Abhishek Selva Kumar, who's a young Tamil asylum seeker who was denied permanent protection, told the rally in Gadigal that up to 12,000 people in his situation were already facing severe discrimination and hardship, and the new bill would make their lives even harder. He said, we don't need more punitive bills. We need policies that welcome asylum seekers and policies that ensure that asylum seekers get the permanent visas they deserve. And Gunai Gunjitmara and Japarung Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe has joined calls from medical experts for incarcerated people to have equal access to health care. A March report by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, appointed by the federal government to review medicines for the PBS or Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, recommended that people in prison have equal access to medicines available to the broader community. Thorpe said on May 1 that the recommendation was welcome and that access to PBS medicines will save lives. She said people are dying from preventative health conditions in prisons. They can't access the same screenings, medications and therapies that they normally could in the community and that these changes would save lives. First Nations people are the most incarcerated people on earth and so are disproportionately impacted by the lack of health care. On top of this, 40% of people who enter the prison system have underlying mental illnesses and there have been numerous deaths in custody that have been linked to a lack of healthcare, including the death of Wanarua man Danny Witten in 2015. Labor's 2024 budget is here. Labor claiming they would address the cost of living crisis, but instead, the budget leaves the poorest more than $220 a week under the poverty line, and at the same time gives more than $4,500 in tax cuts to the richest people who are earning more than $190,000 a year. It also leaves billions in big business tax concessions and subsidies untouched. The biggest winners, by far the gas companies, arms manufacturers, developers and landlords. And as the Australian Council of Social Service noted, this is a budget that has a hole in its heart. The budget does not include any increase to welfare payments like job seeker and youth allowance, and only a tiny 10% rise to Commonwealth rent assistance, which is next to nothing when compared to skyrocketing rent prices and will not provide much relief to renters. The $300 household energy bill discount while will be welcomed by some, is basically a huge cash handout to energy companies who have continued raising electricity and gas prices. Over the next three years, Labor proposes to spend almost $50 billion in fossil fuel subsidies and to put a $12 billion down payment on the AUKUS nuclear submarines. Over the next decade, Labor plans to spend nearly $1 trillion on military. Now, there is some money for renewable energy development in the budget, but overall, Labor is not taking any serious action to tackle the climate crisis. More than 380 leading climate scientists say the world is heading to a global temperature increase of 2.5 degrees, which would lead to semi-dystopian conditions including famines, conflict, droughts and mass migration, driven by heat waves, floods, wildfires and deadly storms. Almost half of the scientists surveyed expect warming to reach 3 degrees, which would be even more devastating. Meanwhile, Labor has announced it will continue to accelerate major new fossil fuel projects to 2050. In fact, Labor has actually decided to expand gas in the middle of a climate emergency, with Resources Minister Madeleine King claiming to be anxious about avoiding a shortfall in gas supplies. King claims that Australia is still on track for net zero in 2050, but others, including the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, disagree. The International Energy Agency has forecast that global gas demand will likely peak in 2030 and then rapidly decline. 
Now, Australia's biggest use of gas is actually for liquefaction for export, and it is predicted that there will be a global glut in LNG in the second half of the decade. Labor's future gas strategy relies on unproven carbon capture usage and te uh, storage technology to decarbonize and reduce emissions. And the plan uh, to prioritize gas exports instead of allocating funding and resources to the climate transition is the same approach as taken by former Prime Minister Scott Morrison. It's a failure to all those who elected Labor in part because of better climate policies. And Labor's spending five times more on fossil fuel subsidies than it is on its key housing policy. At the same time, Labor's ignoring First Nations people who oppose gas mining on their lands for cultural and ecological reasons. And Gomeroy elder Auntie Polly Cutmore, who's been campaigning against Santos's Narrabai coal seam gas project for more than a decade, said to us, land, air and water rights are fundamental and exist concurrently with human rights. Now, determined to stop the fossil fuel driven destruction of the planet, school students and climate activists gathered outside Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek's office in Gadigal on May 3, demanding urgent action to stop the climate crisis. The action was part of Rise Up 12 Days of Action, called by a coalition of environmental groups aimed at highlighting Labor's failure to end fossil fuel mining. The main demands include no new coal and gas, 100% public renewable energy by 2030 a just transition for fossil fuel workers and communities, real carbon cuts, not offsets, and First Nations-led solutions. Year 11 student Jeremy said climate change is threatening our future. Labor has gone back on its words to take decisive action, and we urgently need real action now to end the coal and gas industry. A few days later, several hundred climate activists protested outside Kirribilli House, which is the Prime Minister's official residence, on the 8th of May. The protest featured a DJ booth hosted by stand-ins for uh, Albanese and the CEOs of mining companies Santos and Whitehaven, and it was designed to send a message to the government ahead of the federal budget on May 14. Speakers condemned the Labor government's support for fossil fuel projects, including billions of, the billions of dollars in subsidies. Now, in, over in WA, after rejecting an inadequate offer from the Department of Education, the State School Teachers Union of Western Australia held a half-day strike on April 23. The profession is at breaking point, or past that point, and the union is making 98 claims that boil down to four areas, wages, workload reduction, staffing, and addressing complex behaviour. Wages have fallen so far behind inflation that annual pay rises after 2021 were effectively pay cuts. Many schools are struggling with teacher shortages and remaining teachers are forced to take on more and more work. 12,000 teachers joined the strike, including 9,000 of them in Baldu or Perth. A New South Wales Labor passed amendments to the Local Government Act on the 9th of May, which give the Minister for Local Government the ultimate say over whether councils can demerge or not. Despite its pre-election promise to communities, Labor, with the support of the coalition, has shifted power away from communities. Brian Halstead from New South Wales Demerge Alliance said Labor MPs spoke at length about how forced council amalgamations had failed communities and that this is one hell of a about turn from before the 2023 elections and that communities will not forget Labor abandoning them. Labor and the coalition rejected Greens MLC Amanda Cohn's local government amendment de-amalgamation plebiscites bill, which was produced in consultation with communities across the state and would have enabled councils to hold binding plebiscites on de-amalgamation. Now, on the topic of local councils and democracy, Sue Bolton, the Socialist Alliance councillor at Marybeck Council, is standing for re-election at the Victorian local government elections in October this year. She is standing in the Bababi Dijanang ward, which covers Faulkner and parts of Coburg North. If re-elected, it will be her fourth term as a passionate and dedicated socialist councillor since her initial election in 2012. Bolton told Green Left the shift away from proportional representation to single member wards this election will favour Labour and the Greens over socialists and progressive independents. She said, we need people to vote for an activist council, a council that stands up for working class people. We don't want a council that just rams things through bureaucratically. We need councils which work with residents. Bolton has been involved in campaigns to stop privatisation of council assets, including waste collection services, aged care, 
saving parks and open spaces, and campaigning for accessible and frequent public transport. She saved the outdoor pool at Faulkner and the Glenroy Post Office. And Bolton has also challenged racism and championed international solidarity. In November, she inspired Marybeth Council to take a strong position opposing Israel's genocide in Gaza, one of the first councils in the country to demand an end to the genocide, and also support for Palestinian refugees and to raise the Palestine flag above council buildings. She was also instrumental in helping residents organize and build pro-Palestine protests outside Labour MPs' offices, and has addressed a citywide pro-Palestine rally and many of the community-led protests in the northern and western suburbs. Now, if you want to help out Sue Bolton's campaign or find out more, you can contact uh, 0458 958 385. Now, let's hear what's happening around the world. Just like in the US, Australia and around the world, students across Canada have set up encampments in solidarity with Palestine, demanding their universities disclose all investments and divest from Israeli institutions and companies supporting or profiting from the genocide of Palestinians. At least 12 universities across Canada now have encampments, and most have grown in size and resolve despite efforts by Zionists and pro-Israeli politicians to demonize and shut down encampments. The encampment at the University of Calgary, which is one of the biggest universities in the country, was violently evicted and dismantled by police after only a few hours on the 9th of May. Calgary administration called the police and shut off power around the encampment, and more than 50 police vehicles were deployed, with riot police attacking uh, students with guns drawn, tearing down tents and pushing people to the ground. Police also attacked the University of Alberta encampment on the 11th of May. There's growing support from staff members um, at various universities, with Faculty for Palestine releasing a statement on the 9th of May expressing full support for the encampments. The statement reiterated the commitment to the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, echoing the slogan, Disclose, divest, we will not stop, we will not rest. And protests have erupted in the Georgian capital of Tbilisi to protest the passing of a new foreign influence law which seeks to label organisations, including NGOs that receive more than 20% of their funding from outside Georgia, as organisations pursuing the interests of a foreign power. This will mean additional monitoring, fines, and will limit the ability of these organisations to function, and it will also predominantly affect organisations that support vulnerable and marginalised people in in Georgia, including refugees, LGBTIQ people, and people with disabilities. The law is seen by critics as a conservative Russian-influenced approach to silencing, stigmatizing, and limiting the power of NGOs and grassroots community organizations. Protesters have been fired on with rubber bullets, tear gas, pepper spray, and water cannons by riot police, aiming to intimidate them. But the protesters have stood strong and have now been joined by thousands more. Over in Argentina, since far-right President Javier Millet took office in December, he has embarked on a program of public spending cuts that have led to suffering for millions. But these neoliberal reforms have been met with growing grassroots resistance, with several nationwide demonstrations in a matter of weeks. The latest of these was a 24-hour general strike on the 9th of May called by the General Confederation of Labour, which is the country's biggest trade federation. It was called to oppose the Omnibus Bill, which would roll back workers' rights and privatise public services. This was the second general strike since Millet took office, uh, and there were also huge protest marches on uh, May 7 and April 23, defending public universities, community soup kitchens, and calling for real action on the cost of living crisis. Also in Latin America, huge storms have triggered unprecedented flooding in Brazil's southernmost state of Rio Grande do Sul. The heavy rain has affected more than two-thirds of the state's nearly 500 cities, leaving about 600,000 people displaced, at least 151 people dead, and hundreds missing. Brazilian socialists are calling for a societal mobilization around this new normal, which results from global warming and environmental devastation. 
They say concrete government actions are needed, including guaranteeing basic conditions for those impacted by the floods, suspending electricity and water bills, an emergency settlement and housing plan, and funds for rebuilding logistics and infrastructure. At the same time, long-term planning is needed to end the destructive and extractivist industries that the current development model promotes. And they say the working class needs to unite to challenge neoliberal capitalism, which is ultimately responsible for the current catastrophe. Now we've been keeping you updated with the story of Russian anti-war socialist Boris Kagalitsky, who was arrested by Russian authorities for his anti-war position. And Kagalitsky has been notified that his final appeal against a five-year jail term will be heard on June 5th. The news comes as more Australian politicians add their names to the global petition demanding his release, including Greens Foreign Affairs spokesperson Senator Jordan Steele-John and Gunai Gunjitmara and Jabberong Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe. The petition now has more than 15,000 names from about 100 countries, and Kagalitsky is one of more than 116,000 Russians who have been tried under repressive or administrative articles during Putin's current term. You can sign the petition at the link in the podcast description or at freeboris.info. Now you can read more about all of the stories we've talked about today, as well as videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a Green Left supporter from only $5 a month or donate to our 2024 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate, and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. It's really appreciated. And thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music that you heard on this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Greenleft Online on social media for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.